All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Alan, and it's that time again. Let's talk metal. It's the end of the year, so I guess we should talk end of the year heavy metal. It's that time of year when everybody's putting together their best of the year lists and all of that stuff. Lots of content creators have been posting their top five or top ten or similar types of videos. For my video, I thought I would do it just slightly differently. A few things to point out about it as we get started here. Uh, first off, you know, nobody hears everything, so I don't want to declare that this is the best album of the year, because I've only heard maybe somewhere between 30 and 40 albums total all year. There's a ton of stuff that I am not even aware of that came out in 2022, so I can't really honestly say what's the best album. Another point is that some of these I haven't spent a lot of time with yet. A lot of stuff seemed to come out late this year, or I wasn't able to get my hands on it until late in the year. So while some of these albums I've heard a lot, some of them I've only heard a few times, and that means any type of absolute ranking I try to apply to them would get outdated within the next month or two. So instead of listing them in an exact order, I've listed them in tiers. There's a few sort of honorable mention things I want to quickly you know, give a tip of the hat to. And then I'll go through, you know, the albums I thought were good, the albums I thought were very good, and then the things that are sort of at the top of the tier. And then I'll also have them grouped into some different categories so that if you're more interested in rock or power metal or heavier stuff, they will all be kind of put together, which is why I also decided just to do it in this kind of uh, slideshow layout view rather than trying to pick up and show a bunch of different albums, some of which I only have on Bandcamp and meant I had to show pictures. So yeah, we'll do it this way instead. I'll go through these pretty fast. Just want to say a quick word or two about each of them. And hey, if you're having trouble keeping up, that's what the pause button's for. So it's all good. All right. A few odds and ends that deserve a mention. Malignant Altar had their demos reissued by Dark Descent Records. This is Retribution of Jealous Gods, contains both their demos, so no new material, but they're a fantastic death metal band out of Texas. I think they're in the Houston area. Really like their stuff. They've already got a full-length album out as well, so if you missed their demos, this was a good way to pick them up. Twisted Tower Dyer released a live recording on Bandcamp. This is from a show they played in Raleigh, North Carolina. So if you like Twisted Tower Dyer, make sure you check that out. And Panopticon released a live recording earlier in the year. This was a more folk and acoustic set they did in a famous cathedral in Europe during one of their tours. The proceeds went to benefit some good causes, and it's an excellent live set as well, especially if you like, you know, they're more, you know, Americana, you know, non-black metal type material, which they do an excellent job with. All right, a few new wave of British heavy metal things came out this year. I figured I'd uh, also give them sort of a quick tip of the hat. Uh, Tyson Dog released an album called Midnight. That's not bad. It's not amazing, but it's not bad. I didn't even know Tyson Dog was still around, but... Uh, Hats off to Frank, a regular viewer and commenter, for pointing this one out to me. He also pointed out that Desolation Angels had an album come out this year. Now, I think there's only one original member left, but at least some of the other guys in the band are from the original scene. <clears throat> so he didn't just get a bunch of newcomers to round out the band. This is the kind of album that I'm very leery of because, let's face it, it's been 40 years since the heyday of Desolation Angels. It's Hard to imagine that they're going to recapture the magic at this point. But their album, Burning Black, does have some really fantastic songs on it. It's a little uneven. There are a few clunkers as well, but it did have some really good tunes. So glad that Frank pointed that one out to me and I got to check it out. Um, also, Satan had a new album come out, Earth Infernal. This is better than their last album on First Impression. I haven't played it a ton, you know, to be honest, Satan just isn't the band for me when it comes to new wave of British heavy metal revivals. I know that's kind of heresy. Most people have been, have been really blown away with the albums they've produced over the past 10 years. I tend to think they're okay, but uh, I don't put them up on that same pedestal that most other folks do. But if you missed it, Satan does have a new album, and it is pretty good. All right, let's get into that good tiers. These are albums I like, I enjoyed. You know, they're not going to make you the top of the top of the best of list for the year, but still deserve a shout out. 
On the sort of hard rock end of the spectrum, Scorpions, of course, released Rock Believer to much fanfare. A lot of folks heralded this as their best album in a couple of decades, and it was quite good. A lot of uh, really strong tunes on it, like Peacemaker, Gas in the Tank, Rock Believer. Some of the other tunes aren't quite as strong, but it was a fun listen and a very good one overall. Uh, The Cult also released a new album this year, Underneath the Midnight Sun. This one has Ian Ashbury on vocals, and as long as they've got that, The Cult is always worth checking out. It's a very good album. It's kind of a quiet, moody, atmospheric album. Very subdued. This is a long, long way from Sonic Temple or anything like that. It's got an almost sultry air to it, uh, but really good songs. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. This is one I haven't gotten to play a ton just yet. The packaging on the Digipack, by the way, is pretty atrocious. There's, It's extremely minimal. You'd almost think it was produced by Earache. This is one I, I recommend it, but if you're okay with digital music, you, you'll be just fine downloading this from Bandcamp or some other sites. Yeah, there's not much to the physical uh, CD itself. But yes, a good album nonetheless. <clears throat> and finally, the middle picture there. Clean Break is a new project from James Durbin. He was the fellow who sang with Judas Priest on American Idol and then sang with Quiet Riot for a hot minute, did some solo stuff, and now he's recruited some veteran musicians for this Clean Break project. The band features Mike Flint's from Riot and the rhythm section from Striper. They sound very tight on this release. Musically, this is very close to a band like Master Plan or 90s era Riot when Mike DeMeo was the vocalist. So if that's your jam, the Clean Break album is quite a good one. All right, some good power metal releases from this year. Avantasia released an album called A Paranormal Evening with the Moonflower Society. That's a sentence I just said out loud. Hmm. So despite the very uh, cumbersome name and the artwork that is definitely Tim Burton inspired, hey, let's face it, uh, Thomas Matt always goes for that kind of goth pop look, kind of a Euro version of Hot Topic, I suppose. But eh, if it works for him, fair enough. This is exactly what you'd expect from Avantasia, big bombastic rock opera type stuff with lots of guest appearances in different vocal positions throughout the album. Avantasia albums are usually good. Every now and then they do release one that misfires a little bit for me. This one I've only heard a couple of times, but I do like it. I think it is you know, very strong, exactly what you want Avantasia to do. Uh, next up, we've got Seven Kingdoms with Zenith. This is a Florida power speed band that used to sound like early Blind Guardian. On this album, the first like singles and videos they did seemed to show them leaning a little bit more popish at times. They did a cover of a Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Not a great choice for a way to promote the new album, in my opinion, but that's just me. But I am happy to report that it's a pretty good power metal album at the end of the day. There are one or two tracks that stray a little too much into the commercial friendly side of things, but there's lots of good solid tracks on it as well. And of course, Blind Guardian released The God Machine. I've talked about this one at length on several occasions. It is a good album. Uh, It's a return to their kind of power speed metal sound. The symphonic parts are played down quite a bit for the first time in 20 years or more. However, for my money, the songs are a little too samey. The production is not helping matters any. Charlie Balfind has produced a lot of power metal bands over the years, but he's a little bit inconsistent. Sometimes the albums sound great. Sometimes they miss the mark. And I feel on this one, everything feels a little flat and a little low. Uh, I think a lot of people were just so happy that the band went back to doing a power speed metal kind of album that they missed the fact that this is not that amazing of a power speed metal album. Uh, It is nowhere close to the band's older releases whatsoever. Still a good album. It always sounds like I'm crapping on it, but it is a good album. It has a lot of songs that individually I like. I just think the album as a whole ends up being less than the sum of its parts. Cool album. Don't know how much replay it'll get, but, uh, There we have it, some good power metal albums from 2022. Let's move into the heavier stuff. Uh, Vile Rights was a new band that 
produced a really good album. Uh, thanks again to Brian over at Brian Arkham for getting me turned on to this one. They sound a little bit like, you know, 90s era death output. It's a decent starting point for reference. The album has very good sound considering it's a debut and kind of a smaller release. Definitely check them out. Next up, uh, Morgan returns with their first album in several years. If you're not familiar with Morgan, they are German's answer to Bathory. Bathory's early stuff was all black metal. Later stuff, they switched gears into Viking metal, and Morgan decided, why not both? So yeah, their shtick has always been that every album contains some songs that could have been on one of the first two or three Bathory albums, and some songs that could have come off of Hammer Heart or Twilight of the Gods. On this particular album, which is called Anwen, Morgan mostly sticks to the Viking metal material. There's only one song that is out and out, you know, early Bathory worship, and that's Burning Witch. Some of the other songs have the heavier, faster, blackened parts, but, you know, they kind of go back and forth between that style and the Viking style. So good album. I'm glad to hear that they're back, although well, it's only one of the two original guys uh, is in this lineup. One of the guys has been replaced. I do wish the album had just a little bit more of a balance between the blackened stuff and the Viking stuff, but still a good listen. All right, next up, we have Black Silas with Esoteric Atavism. This is a raw black metal project out of Portugal. I believe this is their sixth album. I've only heard a couple of their albums. I don't know their whole catalog. Uh, for a very lazy point of reference, you can think something that sounds a bit like the French LLN scene, and you're at least in the ballpark. So very raw production values here. If you can get through the production, there is some very good black metal, some very catchy parts, some good melodies uh, buried in that mix. This one sounds a little bit more aggressive and a little bit rougher in the production than the previous material I've heard by the band, but it's still been a good listen. This is one I've only heard a couple of times so far, but I'm looking forward to checking out more of it once I you know, rotate back to it. I've been in a mood lately investigating some raw black metal bands, so this will definitely be getting more spins. And... In the Doomy side of things, the sort of Godfathers of Doom, Candlemas, had a new album come out, Sweet Evil Sun. This one, uh, again, features, I believe it's Andres Johansson on vocals. He sang back on Epicus Doomicus in the early days and was also on their most recent album, The Door of Doom. He sounds more comfortable and confident on this album than on the last one. I think a lot of the material for the last album had been written with somebody else in mind, but then, you know, he kind of joined late. And it's always a little awkward when you're singing on material that was written for someone else. So yeah, definitely um, vocals sound stronger here. The album is exactly what you expect from Candlemas. Great riffs, great doomy material. The only problem here is that there's nothing that is maybe top-notch, A-plus kind of material. It is another good Candlemas album. By most band standards, this would be a highlight of their career. But Candlemas has so many top-tier epic albums over the past several decades that eh, having just another good Candlemas album, <laughs> it's kind of hard to make a dent. I don't know if there's anything on this that would make the best of Candlemas you know, playlist at all, even though it's a very solid album of doom metal and can't complain about it, except maybe the production could have been a little stronger. All right, some more good stuff from 2022. Destruction came out with Diabolical. This one, of course, was met with a lot of trepidation because the longtime guitarist was gone, but placements came in, and it still sounds to my ears like a very classic Destruction album. So I thought it was a good release. I have not revisited it in several months, so don't know if it'll get a lot of play, but it was a good album. Immolation released Acts of God early in the year. Another very strong outing from Immolation. Those guys are incredibly good songwriters in that you know style of death metal. If the album has two faults, it is a tad long, and it has to follow up Atonement, which is a very tough act to follow. That's been uh, heralded by a lot of fans as their best album in a very long time. But Acts of God is great, too. If you missed it, you should definitely check it out. And finally, here we had Autopsies, Morbidity, Triumphant. 
and this one's gotten good reviews. I, it's a good album. It has not clicked with me yet. I played it a handful of times. I realized I just wasn't in the mood for it, so it really wasn't registering. So I've set it aside. I'll come back to it when I'm in the mood for some autopsy and give it another fair chance then. All right, let's move up to the really good tier. So these are the ones that maybe got some more time, more spins, made a stronger impression on me. We'll start with Blut Os Nord and Disharmonium. I'm very late to this band. It's a name I heard forever, but just never came across their albums until Hallucigenian came out, and that was recommended to me by Ben over at Brain Smasher. Really liked that one and really liked this new one as well. It's, of course, very chaotic. There's some interesting production stuff going on with the guitars and the vocals that make it a very challenging listen, but in the good way, in the sense that you hear it and you think, oh, that's a very strange, dense album, but I want to hear it again and try to sort some of it out. This is a band that in 2023, I'm going to try to make it a point to dig into their back catalog some because they seem to be a very interesting, talented band and just not familiar with much of their material. Um going to be relying on the deep dive that Jeff and Kellen worked on on their channels to sort of work as a some a roadmap to help me through the back catalog. All right. Megadeth, of course, released The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead to much fanfare. When this was announced, I was not interested. Megadeth's catalog is very uneven. Every time they release a really good album, they also tend to release a mediocre one and also one that kind of stinks. So you never know what you're going to get. But this turned out to be an incredibly strong album. It's not perfect. There are a couple of songs that could have been left off, but overall, I like it quite a bit. I think it's the best thing they've done probably since Endgame. Uh, Dystopia was good, but has its issues. This one, again, features Kiko on guitar. Uh, him and Dave really light it up. Fun album. I think it benefits from Dave putting aside the political ramblings and just focusing on other subjects for lyrical content. We've all heard Dave rant and rave about the man and the system more than enough times, whether you agree with him or not. After 30 or 40 years, the message gets a little tired. But they did deliver a really good album. Hypocrisy also delivered a good album with Worship. And I've been a little peeved that none of the local stores bothered to stock this one. Uh, it sounds incredibly strong. Hypocrisy is a band I had not revisited in a long time, so there's some albums I've missed along the way. But they, of course, have a reputation for being very good, very consistent, and kind of straddling that line between extreme and more melodic types of death metal. All right. Uh, Canada's Spell released an album late this year called Tragic Magic. Spell is a hard one to pin down. Uh, they've made some noise and some waves. I heard them, I guess it was their second full length, and just didn't appreciate what they were doing at all. But then I gave Opulent Decay a chance and was really blown away. <clears throat> Here was a band that was all of a sudden writing very catchy tunes um, that have a very weird sort of pop sensibility coming from like you know, in 1980s music filter. It's really hard to describe, but you know, it's got the, you know these big pulsing, thumping bass lines that are very prominent in the mix, but in a good way. Tons of vocal you know, hooks, nice guitar parts. I'm kind of at a loss as to whether Spell should even be on the heavy metal shelf or on something like the goth rock pop shelf. I, I don't know. All I know is I really like the music. This album picks up where Opulent Decay left off. The vocal performance is stronger here, uh, and the bass Still has just great sound, even though I think the band has slimmed down to only two full-time members at this point. If you're not sure about Spell, you haven't checked them out, I'd recommend try out the first four tracks on the album. And if by the end of track four you're not sold on what they're doing, you can just stop there. You know what's coming. The rest of the album's not going to you know win you over at that point, even though there's good songs you know through the rest of the album too. Have really enjoyed Tragic Magic, one of the better releases of the year for sure. All right, next up we have Feytooth. This is a doomy project from Los Angeles. They released Remnants of the Vessel. Hasn't come out except on cassette and Bandcamp, but there's a vinyl pressing scheduled for 2023. Uh, 
This one famously was on the Heavy Metallurgy Album Club. Uh, and all four guys on the show that night, Jim, Marty, Ben, and Kellen, absolutely just gushed, ranted, and raved about the album. I didn't get to listen to it that week leading up to the show. And so while listening to the four of them just carry on and on about it, I was thinking to myself, oh, geez, this is not good because now I want to hear it with all these expectations and it's bound to fall short. Actually, it holds up very, very well now that I've had a chance to spin it some. I went ahead and purchased it on Bandcamp. Kind of a hard sound to describe. They have some of the really sorrowful and heavy elements of, say, warning, watching from a distance. But it's also mixed with a lot of the kind of prettier side of, say, Morgian's Solinari album. And at the same time, it's got this very heavy killer guitar tone. So you got to kind of cram those three elements together and you're getting in the ballpark. Um, some of the guys mentioned you know, it has you know, kind of a sludge undertone. Sludge is always a hard term for me to pin down, but you know, I'll take their word for it. So sort of a sludgy warning morgian -y thing going on. Uh, very cool album nonetheless. Uh, excellent debut, really good sound. If anything I just described piqued your interest, you should check it out. This is probably a good time for me to mention as well that Heavy Metallurgy will be doing their 2022 end of the year show uh, in just a few days. This video is scheduled to come out on Tuesday, December 27th. And so on Friday, December 30th, 2022, the Heavy Metallurgy live stream at nine o'clock that evening. Uh, myself and Marty are hoping to have multiple guests on to all come on and talk about their favorite albums of the year. Lots of folks have been doing this type of video on different channels. You should go check all of those out. But if you'd like to see a bunch of folks in one place do the same thing, then tune in Friday night, December 30th at 9 over on Heavy Metallurgy, and you can kind of compare everyone's lists in you know short order. All right, getting back to my own tiers here. Uh, Enchantment also came out with their first album in, well, forever. Uh, this one's called Cold Soul Embrace. This was big news, of course, from the UK kind of death doom scene that these guys were back. Mark G with a C, of course, is on YouTube as a content creator and a really nice guy. So folks were very curious to see what they were going to come out with. And they came out with a really good album. This is one I have not gotten to spend enough time with yet. Looking forward to giving it more attention in the near future. The thing that immediately jumped out at me, though, was that... This album has a very adventurous sense to it. You know, it, sometimes when you get into you know, these slower, death doomy hybrids, I, those bands sometimes do work in very narrow parameters and move at a very slow pace, which can make the music you know a little bit dull and predictable at times. But the first thing I noticed about this album, Cold Soul Embrace, is that they were definitely coloring outside the lines. They were trying other things, incorporating different elements so that, you know, it never felt like it was going to be stale or boring. You listen through it and you hear different parts and it's just like, oh, that's really cool. They incorporated something different here. Ah, oh, and here this part of this song is actually different. Not in a weird, what the hell are they doing way, in a, oh, that's cool. I want to hear more of this way. So yeah, excellent release there, Cold Soul Embrace. Definitely got to spend more time with that one here early in 2023. A few more really good releases uh, for tra traditional metal. Iron Flames, Where Madness Dwells, is a kick-ass release. All their albums have been very good, but this one is just out of the box, instantly lovable. Everything just seems to click on a little higher level than uh, the previous albums. The vocals sound fantastic. Great melodies, very catchy. Everything's just very, very tight. Absolute great album. Najachwin, of course, did the excellent Kanaoa Black. This is Andrew and Aaron's project. It's a meticulously well put together album, well researched, a lot of love and effort obviously poured into this album. Excellent listen. Uh, Nachachwin, of course, at this point is being put into that kind of indigenous black metal category that's gotten a lot of hype in 2022. But nachachwin has been at it, you know, for quite a while at this point. So if somehow you missed that album, definitely check it out. Amazing listen. In that same little subgenre, Black Braid came out uh, with a short album called One. 
this band has gotten a huge amount of hype, and I know that can be very off-putting to some folks, but it, this is a damn good album. It really is. Uh, it's, as I said, relatively short. It's kind of proof of concept work here. The guys had a big presence on Bandcamp, a lot of advertising for merchandise in the record. He's been already featured in Rolling Stone. I think Blackbird just got added to the Hellfest lineup for 2023. So yeah, there's a lot going on there. And well, again, some folks may be skeptical of, does it live up to it? Musically, it sounds very, very good. One thing I think that helps this particular album is that he decided to use a very clean, loud production, and it makes the songs sound very ferocious, very fierce. And apparently he almost went with more of a sort of cult necro underground production that was his original intent but in interviews he's said that you know he noticed a lot of other bands had been doing that and it, he kind of thought to himself well what's the point of me just making my album sound exactly like theirs maybe i should go with the cleaner production after all and he did and i think it was a good choice i think it really added a lot to the material so he's already working on new material he has said the second album will be longer and will be different so it'll be pretty cool and interesting to see where the project goes and how much uh, momentum he can continue to build. Okay, we're ready to get to the top tier. So these are some of the albums I think that are right there among the best of the year. These are listed in no particular order here. Again, I've not tried to rank everything exactly. But first up, we've got Sadistic Ritual. This is a band out of Atlanta, Georgia, and their album this year was the Enigma Boundless. Weird cover. I would never have paid this any attention in the record store, except Kellen reviewed this over on the Killing for Company channel, talked about it very positively. And I've learned eh, this year and last to pay attention when Kellen gives something a strong thumbs up. So I picked this up and yeah, I really liked it. For lack of a better description, I guess you could call it blackened thrash. But... To be clear right away, this is not blackened thrash in the style of Bewitcher or Midnight. This is not your get drunk and party with Satan kind of black thrash. There's nothing wrong with that style. I like a lot of the albums in that style. But this is a little more serious, a little darker, a little more cerebral in tone. But it has you know those you know kind of raspy black metalish vocals uh, over very loud, strong uh, musicianship. The production is probably the one thing they could have worked on a little bit. It sounds a bit brick walled to me. I think if they'd added, you know, some more subtleties and dynamics in the production, it could have really accentuated the songs and taken them to an even higher level. Nevertheless, this album spent a lot of time in my CD player throughout 2022. Uh, it's a very cool listen. They've, you know, kind of carved out their own unique sound. That's what had gotten Kellen's attention was that this was a band kind of doing thrash metal in a new and interesting way. And yeah, I'd have to agree with them. Really cool album from Sadistic Ritual. All right, very different style here. In the progressive metal category, we have Sweden's Seventh Wonder with their album The Testament. Seventh Wonder is the best band in this style for my money. And again, there's tons of bands I don't know and haven't heard, but among the ones I've checked out, Seventh Wonder is the best. Um, two things put this band over the top. They have Tommy Karavik on vocals, and he's an absolute treasure. He's also the lead vocalist for Camelot these days. The other thing that helps Seventh Wonder surpass the competition is they really understand how to write songs. Not just play complicated progressive music, not just do all these different fancy changes and scales and time signatures. The song comes first. And it never gets lost in the showmanship. And that's very evident on the tracks on the Testament. Their previous album was a concept record, and it had some good songs on it, but I think the album did get a little bogged down in the story. They've done a couple of concept records, and while not bad at all, sometimes the story weighs down the music a tad. I think Seventh Wonders at their best when they avoid the concept albums and stick more to just writing really good songs in this you know, catchy, progressive style. Great vocal hooks, great guitar parts. Everything is tight. You know, A-plus musicianship, A-plus vocals, uh, excellent songwriting all the way through. All right, so new wave of traditional heavy metal yet. 
Yep, here we go. Riot City from Canada come out with their second album, Electric Elite. Awesome album cover. <laughs> I love that album cover. Uh, what can you say here? With this album, I think Riot City propel themselves to the front of the new wave of traditional heavy metal pecking order. And yes, I'm saying they're now above Visigoth and Eternal Champion for my money. Riot City really focuses on the power speed side of things, and they do it extremely well. This album features a new vocalist, but you wouldn't notice it much. There's not a big vocal style change from the first album. The lead-off track alone is an absolute masterpiece. It immediately goes on the best-of playlists for this style of music. I get that this is not for everybody, that some folks are going to look at this, roll their eyes, and just say... Mm -hmm. Guys, you know, you weren't even born in 1983. Why, why are you trying to emulate something from 40 years ago? Develop your own style and sound, for God's sake. I understand why that irritates some folks. And there are a lot of bands doing this that they are pretty mediocre, but there are also some that are extremely good, and Riot City is right there. So, yeah, had to shout this one out. Uh, excellent release. Um, you never know how much mileage some of these bands are going to get from sticking to these kind of you know retro vintage sounds riot city has now put out you know two absolutely fantastic albums and hopefully there's more to come all right also on the top tier we have dream and ending with the uh, song of salvation this is one i have not gotten to spend a lot of time with kind of came across this one late in the year after hearing just like the first half of the album i had already ordered it and that's kind of rare for me Unusual style, you know, lots of, you know, heavier, you know, again, deathy, doomy stuff. But this album also seems to have a lot of, you know, cleaner, clearer parts to it. Uh, with some female vocals, softer sections. I think I heard their previous album, but it didn't really, you know, stick with me at all. Yeah, from what little I remember, this album definitely focuses on being a little bit, you know, more clean, not, you know, as harsh. But yeah, it seems to be an amazingly well put together album. Just need to spend more time with it. Even just you know the couple of spins it's gotten so far, it's already going to be right here among the top releases of 2022 for me. So dream and ending, yeah, this one just seems like a pretty amazing effort that's gotten put together. Last one I'll mention is the new album from Psy called Shiki. Psy is one of those bands I've always kind of liked and admired. They push the envelope, of course, very avant-garde and all that. It's the kind of stuff sometimes I struggle with, but Psy is one of those bands I always give a chance. I don't always rush out to get their albums because I know they're going to be challenging, but I pick them up sooner or later, and most of the time I enjoy them. This album is being hailed by a lot of folks as their best in a very long time. The thing that really seems to set this album apart is there's a stronger emphasis on, I hate to say more linear songs, because that's selling the album a bit short. There is still plenty of the varied instrumentation that you'd expect. Yes, there's plenty of saxophone. And yes, I know I'm very anti-saxophone and heavy metal, but Psy is the exception. Every rule has an exception. Psy, you go ahead and play as much saxophone as you want to. I will not complain. No, you other bands, get out of the woodwind section. Okay? Go and something else uh but getting back on point here uh, the songs here you know, feel more like songs you know sometimes psi compositions can feel like they took pieces of 13 different songs and spliced them all together into a six minute entity that they call a song it can be really cool but it's a very you know very difficult thing to wrap your head around each song on this album feels like they had a concept for a song and they want to pack in all kinds of cool, different ambient stuff, but they're going to work within the parameters of a song. And as such, this album is a lot more replayable. A lot of times with Psyalms, you play it, you think that's pretty cool and interesting. I'm going to have to wait a little bit before I play that again. With Shiki, I can play this album straight through and immediately think, oh, yep, let's let's just run that back and play it again, because that just sounds awesome. They had some guys come in from a couple of other bands to help out on this recording. Maybe that uh, allowed them to focus in a little bit more on song structures. The album sounds amazing. Excellent production. 
Some Psy albums in the past suffered from really weird production issues, but this one sounds fantastic. It starts off right away with a very slow, heavy, crawling, kind of doomy riff that puts you in mind of Scorn Defeat. It's got you know that kind of you know, Hellhammer or early Celtic Frost played extremely slow vibe that we haven't heard the band do in a long time. So it gets your attention from the very first riff, and it's just a fantastic listen the rest of the way through. All right. That is it for me. Now, there are some other albums I heard this year, but they may have been ones that didn't really do as much for me or that I only heard literally one or two times six months ago and didn't circle back to. So I didn't feel like I could really comment very intelligently about stuff like, you know, the Voivod or Creator that just didn't get enough spins for me to say anything. So that's where you can leave a comment down below and talk metal there. What albums did I miss this year that I need to check out in 2023? That always happens. You get to the end of 2022, you put together your best of list. First thing you end up buying in January is some album that came out in 2022 and it blows you away and you're like, well, crap, my whole list is shot. It's another reason I decided to go for this kind of tier structure rather than putting them in a numerical ranking. But yeah, what albums did I miss? What were your favorites from 2022? What did you think of some of the albums I've got ranked here? Is there anything you disagree with strongly? Let me know. People can hear albums in different ways, and that's absolutely cool. But it is time to wrap this up. So hope everyone is enjoying their holiday season. Don't forget to check out Heavy Metallurgy on December 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time to hear a discussion with hopefully a lot of different YouTube content creators about their favorite albums from the year. And... Let's all look forward to more great heavy metal recordings coming out in 2023. That is it for now. So until next time, everybody take care. And as always, keep banging your head, even as we work our way into the new year. <laughs>